Okay, so the essay that I'm lecturing on today uh, is uh, called Ethical Relativism by W.T. Stace. And as the book notes, Stace for many years taught at uh, Princeton University. He lived from the uh, late 1800s until 1967. And he did a lot of writing in ethics and in the study, as the book notes, of religion and culture. Um, and uh, he was a kind of a, a public intellectual as well as uh, a scholar uh, writing in the academic world. And so his essay, uh, Ethical Relativism, is a criticism of cultural relativism. Well, especially, it's a criticism of the ethical component of cultural relativism. Last, in last lecture, I said that cultural relativism is a theory asserting that standards of right and wrong, standards of normality, standards of rationality, and standards of beauty are created by, dependent on, and relative to each culture. And what I said was that um, uh, cultural relativism ends up uh, saying that whatever is widely considered right within a given culture is by definition right and that no culture can be mistaken about what is morally right or morally wrong within it. Why? Because it's the final court of appeal that the culture is the final court of appeal, what is right or wrong within it. Now, W.T. Stace is rejecting that. W.T. Stace was a philosopher. He wasn't, uh, unlike a Benedict, he wasn't a social scientist, he wasn't an anthropologist, but he was a philosopher. And he begins his essay by asking what is ethical relativism. And what he says is that an ethical relativist is a person who rejects the idea that there's some sort of objective moral standard that ought to apply uh, to all cultures and at all times. Uh, and uh, that's what is rejected by the ethical relativist. Now remember what I said before in, in last lecture. I said you're an ethical relativist if you believe that standards of right and wrong depend on point of view and are relative to either groups or individuals. Cultural relativism uh, talks about very complex groupings uh, called cultures, and so it relativizes standards of right and wrong to particular cultures. Okay, and what he's doing is he's uh, and he's especially concerned with the claim that what is right or what is wrong will vary completely with each culture, and and whatever is widely treated as right or wrong within a culture will determine what is right or wrong in the culture. And what he says is that this really is a controversial theory, and, and some people may think it's not all that controversial because they misunderstand what it's saying and its uh, implications. Because what he says is this theory is not saying that different cultures can have different norms. And that, I mean, for example, some culture may uh, disapprove of uh, marital divorce. I mean, historically, you could say that about uh, Ireland. And then you could say some culture, and especially, let's say, United States, for example, after the 1970s, let's say, that he, and some other cultures, like the United States, can be much more uh, liberal when it comes to um, the idea of marital divorce. Okay, that's he goes. That's not controversial. It's not controversial to say that in some culture they may be they may be straightforward slavery and that and the people are approving of it. In other culture, there may not be. He goes. That's not controversial. In fact, he says that's something that we should all acknowledge. We know that different cultures can have different uh, uh, customs, and at times different standards. You know, but this is tricky, by the way, because sometimes. Uh, that there, there may be uh, different rules in place uh, because there are radically different situations. For example, let me be very concrete. 
if you're living in a culture in which there is habitual scarcity of water, there could be all sorts of rules and even laws against the luxurious use of water is when people wash their cars. And then you could have another culture where water is plentiful and people can say you, can, you may have all the water you want provided that you pay for it. And yet, in each culture, they may try to come up with principles that work to uh, produce the general happiness. So just because there may be different rules in place uh, in different cultures and in different circumstances will not automatically tell us that they're not uh, some higher level principles that may not be the same. But anyway, so that, that complicates matters. But, but the point is that Stace is saying that there's nothing controversial about acknowledging that, for example, in some cultures, men may be allowed to have uh, multiple wives, and other cultures, uh, are that's not the case. Only one wife. Okay? And so what he's saying is that's not controversial. He goes, what's controversial is the assertion that standards of right and wrong will be determined, completely determined, by the prevailing norms, uh, mores, and institutions of a given culture. And that, that no culture can really be mistaken about what is morally right or morally wrong within its borders. And I thought, in other words, that each culture is the final court of appeal. It's the ultimate referee for what is right or wrong within culture. And he says that's controversial. And he said, as a matter of fact, he rejects it because his view is the idea that there are certain uh, practices that are just plain wrong. And it doesn't matter whether some particular culture endorses them and institutionalizes them and makes them legal. And, you know, you could take uh, the, the examples I like to give uh, are the examples of the Nazis, okay? I mean, uh, because those are very extreme, obviously. But, I mean, if you have a culture that, uh, and someone could argue that there was a Nazi culture, right? They had their own political symbols, their own laws, and political parties. They had their own ideology. Uh, and someone could argue there was a Nazi culture. And if, it, if that's true, and if it's true that according to that Nazi culture, it was right to enslave people and to murder them, uh, and to do that to millions of people because of, let's say, their either ethnicity or their religion, if that, if, if that is true, then that would mean that, that the Nazis, what most people regard as atrocities committed by the Nazis, were right in Nazi culture. Not just considered right, but were right. And what Stace is saying is that, no, he believes there are certain uh, practices that are just plain wrong. It doesn't matter how popular they are. It, does, it really doesn't matter whether they're getting a, a good deal of cultural approval. They're just plain wrong. Now, he doesn't go into good, you know, a great deal of uh, detail about how to determine uh, what's right or wrong, but he does believe there are such standards, and presumably one of the standards would be something like the golden rule, that we should treat people the way we want to be treated. Pretty clearly, the Nazis were not treating Jewish people and, and gay people and Jewish people, I said Jewish people, gay people uh, and uh, gypsies, let's say, uh, in ways that they generally would approve of their own treatment, people treating them or treating their friends, right? So in any event, so some people think that would be one of the standards that we should regard as transcultural, that is to say, as existing beyond and above whatever particular uh, standards are regularly uh, adhered to uh, within a given culture. Okay, so what, what states first he's trying to clarify what he means by ethical relativism. And what he's talking about is the ethical component of cultural relativism. So what he's talking about is, and what he's criticizing, is the assertion that standards of right and wrong are, again, created by dependent on and relative to each culture. Okay, and, he, and then he says a number of things. He says this is a pretty important question about uh, what is the source of standards of right and wrong and whether they can be determined purely and only by the actual standards of any given culture. Okay, now what he does is he looks at two arguments for ethical relativism and What's interesting is 
the first argument, he says, you can just show uh, clearly that it is mistaken. The second argument he finds uh, more powerful, and he thinks there is a response to it, but he's not entirely happy uh, with that response. Okay, remember, the response is going to represent his point of view. He calls himself an ethical absolutist, but the key thing is he believes there's certain uh, things that are just plain wrong, uh, and there are certain principles and standards that people should use regardless of the culture that they're in. And his position is that cultural approval alone cannot automatically make some practice right, and cultural disapproval alone can't automatically make some practice wrong. Okay, so let's look at the, the proposed arguments for uh, ethical relativism. Now remember, he's giving these arguments with the idea of rejecting them in their conclusion. The conclusion will be that, that ethical relativism is correct, that the ethical component of cultural relativism is correct, and he certainly is criticizing ethical relativism. Okay, so what is the first argument? The first argument pretty much says that there is ethical diversity as a matter of fact, and that as a matter of fact, different cultures have different ways of living Okay, and, uh, and what he's saying is that that is not enough to establish cultural relativism and its ethical component. Okay, and uh, so it's the argument, uh, so look at this. Look at the, the, the first argument is that which relies upon the actual varieties of moral, quote, standards, end quote, found in the world. He goes, and then he goes, it was easy enough to believe in a single absolute morality in older times uh, when there was no anthropology, when all humanity was clearly divided into two groups, Christian peoples and the, quote, heathen, end quote. Christian peoples knew and possessed the one true morality. Again, he's not, his position is more complicated than that, but he's trying to explain things before the growth of anthropology and how people discovered that people were living differently. The rest were savages whose moral ideas could be ignored. But all this has changed. Greater knowledge has brought greater tolerance. We can no longer exalt our own morality as alone true, while dismissing all the moralities as false or inferior. The investigations of anthropology have shown that there exists side by side in the world a bewildering variety of moral codes. On, okay, and then he goes and he mentions some places of different places, the steppes of Siberia, the deserts of Australia, the forests of Central Africa, the jungles of New Guinea, and various islands. He says they, can, they have customs that some people regard as fantastic and as highly self-destructive. And then he goes, we learn all, that all kinds of horrible practices are in this, that, or other place regarded as essential to virtue. We find that there is nothing or next to nothing which has always and everywhere been regarded as morally good by all, all people. He says all men, all people. Now he goes, this argument taken by itself is a very weak one. It relies upon a single set of facts, a variable moral customs of the world. But this variability of moral ideas is admitted by both parties to the dispute and is capable of ready explanation upon the hypothesis of either party. The relativist says that the facts are to be explained by the non-existence of any absolute moral code. The absolutist says that they are to be explained by the human ignorance of what the actual, or excuse me, what the absolute moral standard is. And he can truly point out that men have differed widely in their opinions about all manner of topics, including the subject matters of the physical sciences, just as much as they differ about morals. And if the, the various different opinions which men have held about the shape of the earth do not prove that it has no one real shape, neither do the various opinions which they have held about morality prove that there's no one true morality. Thus the facts can be explained equally plausibly on either hypothesis. There's nothing in the facts themselves which compels us to prefer the relativistic hypothesis to that of the absolutist, and therefore the argument fails to prove the relativist conclusion. If that conclusion is to be established, it must be by means of other considerations. Okay. So, now think about what he's saying. He goes, just because there can be diversity of practices um, uh, among cultures, okay, doesn't mean that, uh, that there's not a correct set of standards or that everyone shouldn't employ the golden rule to treat people the way they should be treated. It doesn't, doesn't mean that. 
because he says, look, people can differ and have differed over the shape of the earth. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an objective shape and that some people may uh, not be uh, correct about the shape or closer to being correct than other people. And so he's saying mere diversity of practices doesn't in and of itself prove that there's not some objective standard that uh, all cultures should accept, at least under certain circumstances, things such as the golden rule. So again, diversity of actual practices, he says, will not be sufficient to establish uh, the ethical component of cultural relativism. Now there's another, uh, or I should say the other, argument in favor of uh, the ethical component of cultural relativism that he looks at. There's an, the, the other one he is much more impressed with. He doesn't like the conclusion. He doesn't agree with its conclusion because he's not an ethical relativist. But he's much more impressed with the strength of the argument. Here's the second argument. The second argument in favor of ethical relativity consists in alleging that no one has ever been able to discover upon what foundation an absolute morality could rest, or from a source a universally uh, binding moral code could drive its authority. If, for example, it is an absolute and unalterable moral rule that all men and all people ought to be unselfish, from whence does this command issue. For a command it certainly is, phrase it how you please. There is no difference in meaning between the sentence you ought to be unselfish and the sentence be unselfish. Now a command implies a commander. An obligation implies some authority which obliges. Who is this commander? What this authority? Thus the, va the vastly difficult question is raised of the, the basis of moral obligation. Now, the argument of the relativist would be that it's impossible to find any basis for a universally binding moral law, but that it is quite easy to discover basis for morality if moral codes are admitted to be variable, ephemeral, and relative to time, place, and circumstance. And here is his comment. This argument is undoubtedly very strong. It is absolutely essential to solve the problem of the basis of moral obligation if we are to believe in any kind of moral standards other than those provided by mere custom or by irrational emotions. It is idle to talk about a universal morality unless we can point to the source of its authority, or at least to do so is to indulge in a faith which is without rational ground. To cherish a blind faith in morality may be for the average man whose business is primarily to live right and not to theorize sufficient. Perhaps it is his wisest course, but it will not do for the philosopher his function, or at least one of, the, of his functions, is precisely to discover the rational grounds of our everyday beliefs. If they have any, philosophically and intellectually, then we cannot accept belief in a universally binding morality unless we can discover upon what foundation its obligatory character rests. Now, it's pretty clear that apparently he doesn't think the existence of a good God is provable and that uh, that if that can you know the belief in that will constitute uh, the kind of universal basis he seeks okay so he's not going to bring in God you would think that maybe he would if he's talking about you know uh, morality requiring a commander but he's not interpreting that literally he's not uh, and he doesn't uh, and it's interesting because he really doesn't go into great detail about what uh, a basis for universal morality will look at uh, and he doesn't even get in, he doesn't get into human nature, and he certainly doesn't get into religion or, or theological considerations of a belief in God. And he apparently doesn't think that that'll do it, and that you can prove that God exists, and you can prove what God's commands are. But it's interesting. He does criticize this theory. Now remember, uh, again, this is a theory or an argument for the theory of uh, cultural relativism and its ethical component. Here's his response. But in spite of the strength of the argument thus posed in favor of ethical relativity, it is not impregnable, for it leaves open one loophole. It is always possible that some theory not yet examined may, uh, examined may provide a basis for a universal moral obligation. The argument rests upon the universal negative proposition that there is no theory which can provide a basis for uni a universal morality. But it's notoriously difficult to prove a universal negative. How can you prove that there are no green swans? All you can say is that none has been found so far, and then it is always possible that one will be found tomorrow. Okay. Again, what are, what are, what are we to conclude from this? Well, he believes that this argument is a pretty powerful argument in favor of ethical relativism. But at the same time, he says it is open to an objection. And the objection is that although 
no one has yet found a possibly universal basis for uh, morality that doesn't mean that one day someone will not find such a basis. Okay. So now the rest of his essay really is what I would call a reductio argument. That is reductio ad absurdum. In other words, it's let me try to explain this. The idea of reducing something to the absurd. One of the ways to criticize a theory or an assertion is to say that if the theory or assertion were accepted as true, then there are other propositions or assertions that would have to be accepted as true, and that those other theories or propositions are highly dubious and questionable. Okay, and in, in a lot, in fact, most of the rest of his essay, he does precisely that. In other words, he he says, okay, if you want to accept ethical relativism you know, as a part of uh, cultural relativism, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to accept that, then he says you're going to have to accept other things that most people will find completely unacceptable. So what are some of the things that people find completely unacceptable, at least most people? Well, he says if you want to believe that standards of right and wrong depend only on the actual standards of given cultures, then you're going to have to reject for one thing the possibility of any sort of objective um, moral progress. Let me try to explain. Now I realize that moral, the concept of moral progress can itself be uh, controversial. Let me just give you one example. Historically, the, it, for many, many years, millennia, thousands of years, there were these uh, completely tribal moralities so that someone would <coughs> say that, uh, let's just say that it was morally uh, quite permissible to sell spoiled meat to strangers, but it would be quite unacceptable to sell spoiled meat to uh, other members of one's tribe. Okay, now, and then you would have people who would come along, including people we've come to call prophets, who would say, no, everyone counts, everyone is morally important, everyone is your neighbor. Your neighbor is not someone, just someone who is part of your tribe, someone who has your same religion, but rather all people are your neighbors. All people, and in, within a religious context, people may say everyone's a child of God. Okay, now, and then, you know, the Buddha, over 500 years before Jesus, was saying we should do our best to reduce human suffering for ourselves and others, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether we're dealing with people who are part of our tribe or not. All of us are human beings. All of us uh, need to help one another, and all of us need to do what we can to reduce suffering. In any event, many people would argue that the belief that everyone matters, the belief that we should try in general to reduce suffering and not simply the suffering of people in our tribes, the belief that it is morally unacceptable to sell spoiled meat uh, to people outside the tribe, and it's not, it's not just unacceptable to sell spoiled meat to people within the tribe, but also outside the tribe. People would say that's not simply moral change, but it's moral progress. It's, it's an object, objective expansion of the moral imagination. Okay. Now, to the extent that people believe that over time when people come to accept that everyone is morally important and not simply members of the tribe, or that all people, men and women, and people of different ethnicities are all valuable and all worthy of moral concern. To the extent that people have come increasingly to believe that, many people argue that's not simply moral change, that's moral progress. But here's the thing. According to Stace, he's saying, well, if you're a cultural relativist, you're going to completely identify what is morally right or morally wrong with whatever are the prevailing standards in a given place and time. And so therefore, you will acknowledge moral change, but that doesn't mean that you can acknowledge moral progress, that some change is objectively better. And to the extent that you don't believe in certain uh, values or standards that ought to apply to all cultures, such as the golden rule, and to the extent that you just identify what is right according to what is generally accepted as right within a given culture in a given time, State says you won't be able to acknowledge genuine moral progress. Now related to this, 
is uh, another uh, concept, and that is moral wisdom. Again, this can be controversial as well, as I understand. Now, more, what is moral wisdom? Well, let me just say whatever it is, historically, both within religion and in philosophy, there's been a widely held uh, conviction that it's entirely possible for uh, only a minority of people to have moral wisdom and that uh, it is entirely possible for some popular way of doing things to be unwise. So, and, and you know, within a few generations from the people watching this right now, we could talk about Martin Luther King Jr. saying things like, you know what, uh, segregating people according to ethnicity, race, uh, was has been very popular throughout uh, much of the world, and certainly in the United States. But he says that doesn't mean that it's morally right. He goes, there were Jim Crow laws, right? There were laws that condemn people uh, and laws that said that whole groups of people, especially black people, did not have the same legal rights as white people and were not allowed to use the same bathrooms as, as white people, were not the same water fountains. They were not allowed to eat inside a restaurant with, with uh, white people in the South. And he said, it doesn't matter how popular those laws are. They're wrong. They're wrong. And if people conscientiously disobey those laws but are willing to take all the consequences and do it uh, peaceably, nonviolently, and they're willing to, again, take all the consequences and the legal consequences, then they're taking the moral high ground. And these laws are intolerable. They need to be changed. And the fact that they're part of a way of a living, the fact that they've been institutionalized, the fact that many people accept them, he goes, it doesn't really matter because they're still wrong. They contradict fundamental principles of right and wrong. They even, he says, and, and not only within religion, but including the golden rule, and the belief that uh, everybody is God's child, but they also even, he says, don't uh, measure up to uh, some of the highest standards uh, in America's founding documents, including the Declaration of Independence, that all people are created equal and endowed uh, by the Creator with rights. The idea of human rights that we all have in virtue of being human beings. So, okay, so what is the point? The point is that Stace believes that it makes sense at least to talk about moral progress. Stace believes that it makes sense to talk about moral wisdom. And as I say, there are different wisdom uh, traditions, but one thing that's common among variable or various religious, uh, not only religious, but also philosophical traditions, is the idea that some individual can be wiser than the multitudes. And the Hebrew scriptures, or what some people call the Old Testament, there is a verse that says, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. So just, and the ancient prophets within the Hebrew tradition were often saying, well, this is well-accepted behavior, doesn't mean it's morally right. Okay, hundreds of years ago before Jesus, uh, there was uh, Socrates. Okay, Socrates, one of Socrates' students said to Socrates, you know, that conviction that you're holding right there uh, certainly seems to contradict common opinion. And Socrates said, I don't care what are the opinions of the, of the common people. I only care about the opinions of the wise. The Buddha, over 500 years before Jesus, was asked, what are you? Are you a god? To which he said no. Are you an angel? To which he said no. Are you a prophet? To which he said no. And, and then he said, well, what are you? He goes, I'm awake. So the Buddha means the enlightened one or the awakened one, right? And so what he suggest, but in his view was, yes, we can, other people can become awakened, right? Uh, but his position was that most people, most of the time, are not fully awake. And so he didn't identify wisdom and the people who revere Buddhism and the Buddha, they don't identify wisdom simply with what is commonly believed in a particular place or time. But this idea is that there are certain principles, there are certain hard-won insights uh, into life that are correct independently of what the average person believes. Of course, in Buddhism, one of them is that existence and life are suffering. And then the Buddha tried to prescribe ways that people can find to reduce suffering, okay? And it has to do with reducing the numbered intensity of one's desires and self-mastery, right? And the Buddha held that we can become wiser 
but he tell, but he did, he never identified wisdom with what the average person believes uh, at any given time. Okay, so again, what I'm suggesting to you is that both within uh, religion and in philosophy, there's usually been a distinction between what is wise and then what is properly believed. Okay, and so if you, so Stace in effect is saying if you really think there's something to the idea that there's certain standards such as the golden rule that ought to apply to everyone. If you really believe that there's certain things that are just plain wrong, like selling spoiled meat, he doesn't give this example, but I think he would endorse it, selling spoiled meat to people outside your tribe. If you believe that's just plain wrong, if you believe it's plain wrong to do what the, many of the Nazis did when it came to various minorities, then you ought to be ought not to be a thoroughgoing cultural relativist. So again, what Stace is saying that if you are a cultural relativist and you and you believe in ethical relativism within a cultural context, then he says you're going to need to reject the possibility of genuine moral wisdom as opposed to a commonly held popular opinion. And you're going to have to also reject the possibility of genuine moral progress as opposed to mere moral change. And so the, those are some of the things that Stace is saying. He says something else that is interesting. Stace says that not only does he believe that, that, uh, that ethical relativism is uh, incorrect, but he also thinks that it can be socially dangerous. Here's what he says. He says, to the extent that increasing numbers of people believe that right and wrong, that right and wrong are simply dependent on uh, the uh, actual practices of, 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 of a, a dominant group at a given time, then uh, they will ultimately uh, think that morality is really largely arbitrary and that morality will not carry much authority with them. And, they, and it's very likely they'll ultimately want to do what is most convenient to them. And he says to the extent that people look at morality as arbitrary, they will create more chaos and lawlessness and there will be more suffering. There will be more uh, human suffering. In other words, his position is that philosophy is important and philosophy matters and that the predominant philosophy in a culture can affect the quality of life uh, and the quality of people's conduct within that culture. So he was concerned that, it, that to the extent that a belief in cultural relativism became uh, more and more popular and was taught from, you know, from, by intellectuals to more and more people as through colleges, that this would undermine um, uh, any sort of defensible morality and it would encourage people to think that there's no authority to just about any moral standard. That's all left up to uh, the individual and he thought this would lead to social chaos, to anarchy and lawlessness. So he really believed that, uh, that cultural relativism was not only incorrect when it came to uh, standards of morality, but it, it could undermine um, civil society and undermine uh, respect for our respect for one another. So in any event, the other thing that I want to mention that, that he said is that he said that that, that ethical relativism, he says, when it comes to cultural relativism, he says, is, is really, it's hard even to apply it to a highly heterogeneous culture such as what we have in the United States. Now remember that many of these anthropologists who are defending cultural relativism, including Ruth Benedict, were talking about uh, homogeneous tribes that are in far, were in far-flung parts of the world. Many of them did not have a lot of contact with other uh, with other tribes. And what he's saying is if you think about a very, very complex, uh, heterogeneous, pluralistic, diverse culture like that of the United States, and it's even more diverse and pluralistic now than it was when he wrote, he says, how do you determine what the American position is when it comes to various uh, subjects? Uh, related possibly to ethics, but I mean, so for example, if someone says, what is the American position on premarital sex? Is there one answer to that? Is there, uh, couldn't, it, couldn't it vary? I mean, are you talking to Mormons? Are you talking uh, to people in San Francisco? Or are you talking to uh, people uh, in some highly rural part of Tennessee? Okay, 
And so what he's saying is, are we going to say that morality just shifts as you get in a, 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 a some sort of railway car going across the country? Uh, and he goes, uh, then are, are we going to really say, I mean, in other words, it seems that when people talk, uh, defend cultural realism, and they give us all sorts of interesting examples of behavior most of us regard as extreme and perhaps even self-defeating, they're talking very often about tribes that are very homogeneous, and they're not talking about highly diverse cultures where you have lots of subcultures. And so he says it's hard even, how do you even express cultural relativism when you're dealing with uh, cultures that have lots of other subcultures within them and so a lot of diversity and he's saying it's very are you going to simply take a poll to determine what's morally right uh, in such a culture and so he thinks that that cultural relativism is hard even to express when you're dealing uh, with highly diverse cultures of just uh, highly pluralistic highly heterogeneous. He's saying, how do you even define right or wrong if you're just going to identify it with the moral status quo? And one of the things that particularly disturbed him was the idea that we could defend, we could identify right and wrong simply with the moral status quo. He thought this was not, uh, he says, first of all, he thought that was a mistake. Even if you could do it, it's a mistake. Because what happens is you are saying that, for example, you seem to be implying that someone like Martin Luther King Jr. condemning the, the racist Jim Crow segregation laws was somehow encouraging people to be immoral by rejecting those laws and those standards. Okay? So, what is, so and that's an interesting point of view. And so, are you going to say that anyone who's criticizing some of the some aspect of the predominant morality is automatically wrong, is encouraging people to do that which is immoral, and he said so he couldn't accept that. And he says, well, regardless, whether you're talking about Jesus it was sort of something of a moral rebel or Martin Luther King Jr., he's saying it's just a complete mistake to identify right or wrong simply with what is uh, commonly practiced and commonly believed. And he says because it's possible for the majority to be tyrannical in relation to individuals and minorities. It's possible for the majority to approve of treating others like dirt. It's possible for the majority to, re uh, in practice, to reject the golden rule when dealing with peaceful minorities, as happened in Nazi Germany. So again, his view is that cultural relativism, and, and especially in its ethical dimension, is not only wrong, but it could actually lead to more uh, lawlessness and chaos and undermine uh, legitimate moral standards as increasing number of people do what's convenient for them and regard moral norms as largely arbitrary. Okay, so anyway, so this is uh, Stace's criticism of the ethical component of cultural relativism. And that pretty much concludes what I wanted to say uh, for uh, the lecture for this essay.